Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the Santa Rosa Office of Community Engagement and the Santa Rosa Fire Department for such an important and timely series on being wildfire ready. I'm Scott Westrope, Fire Chief for the City of Santa Rosa. Uh, during the course of this presentation, American Sign Language interpretation will be provided and the interpreter will be spotlit for the duration of the webinar. Before we start, I just wanted to take a, a moment to thank Director Magali Tejas and her team uh, for the idea behind this whole series. Um, this will be our third presentation this week, um, but this is really their doing and, and they really deserve the credit for, for getting the work done and coming up with this idea and getting all the speakers and, and looking at this very holistic community driven event. So thank you to uh, Magali and her team. So the reasons why we're doing this, um, there's there's a lot to it, but um, with everything the community has been through, particularly in the last couple of years, the fires create a very common bond. Um, that's a bond of resiliency, strength, and unfortunately trauma. We as a community have collectively shown what a resilient community looks like and how that strength actually unites us. I truly believe, and my team's probably tired of hearing me say this, but um, it's been evidenced over the last four years that we are stronger together. And that not only goes for the fire department, the city as a whole, the entire county and the entire community, it's all of us, we are all stronger together. Today's workshop revolves around the shared trauma of the wildfires. Through evacuations, fires, planned power shutoffs, other life stressors, and now a global, global pandemic, it's important to take care of our well-being and connect with others. You'll hear today about how this trauma is truly shared amongst the entire community, including members of the Santa Rosa Fire Department and the city organization. As a department, what we have lived through both personally and professionally and continue to endure on a yearly basis is, exceeding ta is exceedingly taxing on the body, mind, and soul. I say this not looking for sympathy, rather to open up a space of vulnerability that we as professional firefighters endure these traumas alongside the community and we are not impervious to their effects. If we begin to continue to heal together, we will holistically be stronger. To discuss this important topic in more detail today, I'd like to turn the presentation over to a panel discussion led by the Sonoma County Resiliency Collaborative. And a quick reminder that both Spanish translation and ASL interpretation are available. With that, I'd like to introduce Griselda Correa. Griselda is the Community Communications and Community Engagement Manager at the Santa Rosa Community Health as well as a leader in the Sonoma Community Resiliency Collaborative, which she is representing today. To help guide us through this work, it is my, uh, my honor to introduce Griselda Correa. Thank you so much for that introduction, Chief. And I'd also like to introduce our other panelists that will be joining us today. Today, I am thankful and grateful to be in community and, and share this space with our trained facilitators from the Sonoma Community Resilience Collaborative. We have Susan Dunn from NAMI joining us today and Becky Ennis from SOS Counseling. I also appreciate to be in space with Deputy Chief Travers Collins from the Santa Rosa Fire Department joining us today in this panel. Before we begin, as we always start our circles and spaces in the Sonoma Community Resilience Collaborative, I'd like to invite Becky Ennis to guide us through some breathing and ground us in the space that we are in today. Thank you. Thank you, Griselda. Um, and as I lead this uh, exercise, feel free uh, to also on the panel, feel free to turn off your video and um, have yourselves muted. If we were in a space together, I would ask you to maybe close your eyes or drop your gaze. Um, so we'll, we'll do somewhat of the same here in a, in a Zoom platform. So to begin, I just would like you to take a moment to find a comfortable position, seated with your spine alert and straight, but shoulders relaxed and down, and your hands maybe resting in your lap. So just take a moment here to take a slow, deep breath in through your nose. And then slowly breathe out through your mouth. 
Once again, just take a nice, slow, deep breath in through the nose. and out through the mouth. Just feeling relaxation coming into your breath. And again, maybe closing your eyes, maybe bringing your gaze down without fixing it on any particular point. And one more deep breath in through the nose. and slowly exhale out the mouth. From here, we'll take a few moments to observe our natural spontaneous breath, what feels normal and comfortable for you. And now let's bring some awareness to our feet in contact with the floor. And begin the scan of the body by moving from your feet through your legs to your knees. Noticing any sensations in this area. And also moving then higher above the knees to the thighs and hips. How you're seated in your chair or couch. How your legs come in contact with that seat. And just accept any tension or discomfort you may have. Any and all sensations are okay. And again, taking another slow, deep breath through your nose. And slowly exhale through your mouth. And then becoming aware of your abdomen, your belly, the area around your belly button. Continuing upwards, feeling your chest expand and contract as you breathe. Maybe even noticing your heart beating in your chest. Any sensations in your back, your lower back or middle area or your upper back and shoulders. And then just gently moving your mind's eye through your arms to your hands and fingers. Coming back again to your shoulders your neck and throat, and any sensations that you might have in your face and in your head, being totally aware now of your whole body in this moment. Allowing your breath to deepen naturally recognizing that when you breathe slowly, you're doing diaphragmatic breathing. Your diaphragm rises when you breathe out and it descends when you breathe in. This encourages the air to go to the bottom of your lungs where more oxygen comes into your body and more carbon dioxide can leave your body. So just gently reminding yourself, soft belly breathing, allowing the belly to expand as you inhale and contract as you exhale. I 
if you're feeling any tension anywhere in your body, imagine that breath going to your that space and place in your body. And each time you exhale, vision that breath taking with that tension and exiting your body. And as the tension leaves, bringing your attention gently back to your soft belly. So now I invite you when you're ready to slowly and gently open your eyes and bring your attention back to this space. Thank you so much, Becky, for getting us in the room and in the present moment. As Chief Westrope mentioned, um, my name is Griselda Correa. I am the Communications and Community Engagement Manager for Santa Rosa Community Health. In addition to uh, the role that I play at Santa Rosa Community Health, we are also spearheading the Sonoma Community Resilience Collaborative that was formed as a response to the Tubbs Fire in 2017 as an, uh, as an effort to help our community recover and heal. We would like to acknowledge that rebuilding goes beyond physically building our homes um, in our community, but it's also about rebuilding our community, our connections, and our emotional well-being. Our vision is to prevent the progression of stress and trauma effects into becoming more serious behavioral, physical, and social impacts in our community. Since then, we have experienced additional community traumas. We've experienced floods, more fires, a global pandemic, and now we're also preparing for fire season once more. With all that in mind, I'd like to invite our panelists to come forward um, and start with some acknowledgement of what are some of the emotions that are coming up as we're preparing for another yet another fire season. I'd also like for each of our panelists to introduce themselves and um, share where is it that they work and what's coming up for you in this moment. And we'll start off with Susan and then go to Becky and then Travis, Travers. Thank you, Griselda. Really, really happy to be here. Uh, where to start? Um, just so, so excited that this is happening. I'm very touched by uh, the words about um, affecting our body and our soul and our minds. You know, across the county, we're all feeling this. And I have had the privilege at NAMI Sonoma County to work with people dealing with fire effects. I'm the Education and Support Services Manager, and we have offered wildfire groups. Uh, for a long time, which has kind of morphed into our wellness um, groups. And just right now, I guess that what's coming up for me is a lot of gratitude and a lot of um, uh, appreciation for all the work of many people that I don't even know that are behind the scenes um, working on our responses to these things. So um, with that, I'll let Becky introduce herself. Thank you. Uh, so Becky Ennis, Executive Director for SOS Community Counseling. Um, I too am honored and privileged to be able to serve the organization. Uh, we are a collaborative of about 25 uh, therapists uh, working to provide um, prevention, education, and intervention around mental health in our community um, with kiddos all the way to adults and couples and families. Um, and the question around um, what's coming up in terms of now, here we are in the, the beginnings of a, of a fire season again, um, just to, to speak to my own immediate networks and social circles. Uh, a lot of things, as Susan said, a lot of things are coming forward. And uh, I'd like to, the things that I'd just like to share at this moment would be um, a certain amount of uh, desperation and exhaustion over preparing for yet another fire season. I think I've, I've heard that quite a bit, um, not only professionally, but personally, and have felt that way myself. Um, and some anxiety over what will happen this year, uh, where will the fire be, when will it happen, um, the anxiety around the weather. Um, so those are kind of the first two things that come from mind for, uh, for me as well. My name is Travis Collins and I'm the Deputy uh, Fire Chief of the Santa Rosa Fire Department. And um, I'm happy to be here and I wanna thank you for including us. This is something that historically 
fire service, public safety isn't really forward facing and being vulnerable and talking about this. So it's pretty nice that we're included in this conversation. There are a lot of um, shared trauma, if you will, that we are all going through together. So um, as I mentioned, we enjoy being forward facing, sharing our feelings and talking to our community members to let them know what they're going through, we feel as well. And maybe to give a little bit of um, reassurance that um, how we're preparing going into this fire season and some of the things we've put in place for our members, because maybe potentially some of the stuff we've put in place for our members to support our members um, with behavioral health issues are something that the community can use as well. So happy to be here and I look forward to contributing. Thank you all. And part of our circles and, and when we are in community is that our moderator facilitators also become part of the circle, right? And so um, I like also, as you all are talking, there are a few kind of things that are coming up for me. Um, so thinking about, okay, preparing for fire season, I moved out of Santa Rosa um, after 2017. I was actually pregnant and found out I was pregnant um, before the fire but really kept in mind, you know, how is this going to affect my child? I'm, I'm, there are multiple things that are coming up. And now as we're preparing for fire season again, I now live in Petaluma, but I still have family in Santa Rosa, specifically where the fire is talking, um, and they've been evacuated every time. So for me, as a way of preparedness, one, I notice that anytime I get an alert, I still have my alerts from Santa Rosa, and anytime I get the alert, I'm like, okay, what's happening? You know, should I be preparing to host family? Um, what is that going to look like? Uh, I do notice in my body, and even as we're having this conversation, that my shoulders are starting to go up, like, oh no, <laughs> here it comes again, right? Um, so those are some of the things that are coming up for me. Uh, and also, whenever I am in Santa Rosa and there are high winds, um, I, I was evacuated in the middle of the night. Um, I didn't, luckily, didn't lose my home, but it, it does bring up wow, these are high winds again, it's getting warm, we're in a drought, what are we gonna do to prepare and how can we prepare? Um, so we can do another round of check-in and, and share you know, what other things are coming up or other uh, triggers that you may be experiencing as we're preparing for fire season. It could be in your, in your personal or professional life. Yeah, Griselda, one thing I'm really struck by, we just had recently a, a warm line call, somebody asking about, recognizing they're dealing with some post-traumatic stress and almost, you know, there's a sense of kind of, well, that was a long time ago. That was the Tubbs fire. And it's, you know, we're talking 2017. It's not that long ago. And for people to understand that these um, symptoms and this situation is in your nervous system and it's there and it's just beneath the surface maybe, but to actively work with it, um, that's, that's what we want to do like Becky's talking about, just working with it. Uh, and just to take away any stigma or shame about I shouldn't be feeling this or this is weird or, uh, you know, I sent a text to my friend and I sounded crazy, you know, just like this is our nervous system just trying to protect us. It's doing its job, which is fight and flight. You know, that keeps us alive. That's our survival mechanism. And to just validate that it has a place but what we really want to do optimally is learn to work with it. Just like Navy SEALs, they learn, they visualize the goal, they have self-talk, they have regulation, which is breath. And, you know, it's almost like um, an athletic competition. Like we're gonna have to run a marathon sometime in the next, you know, three years. We don't know when it's gonna happen. So if you get ready, then you're always ready and you can relax. And so I kind of see it that way that it's a collective thing that we can, you know, this event, we can work towards being readier and just acknowledging what's going on. Um, one of the triggers that's kind of interesting, you know, obviously fire engines, hearing a fire engine, and I just wanna share this little tidbit, Becky and I were talking the other day about this, that I've trained myself when I hear a fire engine, because initially after the Tubbs fire it was like, it would set me off um, to slow down my response and to go, oh, someone's getting help, make it something and I use it like a meditation bell, like, oh, how am I doing? Check in. Am I stressed out? Do I need a break? And just, just work with it. 
And that's the thing with trauma is that the greater the trauma, the greater the opportunity to move to a new place if we partner with it and learn to kind of do the dance with it. So that's what I see this opportunity for Santa Rosa to come to a better place of understanding ourselves better, understanding our neighbors better, um, just improving in every domain that way. So um, yeah, Becky, did you have more that you, or anyone else? Yeah, I'm just resonating with what you're saying uh, about, especially about, uh, well, that was the Tubbs fire and that was a long time ago and, um, and sort of these consecutive disaster after disaster and whether it is fire or whether it's a flood or whether it's maybe a, a family emergency of some kind, you know, the body's um, trying to regulate. And so it, there isn't really a discrimination, you know, to the body as to what's actually causing it. It still feels um, the same. And so kind of to Christelda's point as well about, you know, sitting in a meeting and feeling your shoulders come up and that tension and anxiety that could be caused by anything and could be triggered by anything. And so being uh, okay with and accepting the sensation as it comes and allowing an opportunity for it to move through you. Uh, and, and for me to try to remind myself just to breathe and that uh, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, if I'm lucky to give myself a couple cycles of those breaths is just, it's truly transformative. And I, I know that I tend to underestimate it at times. And, uh, you know, even today, I like, you know, I'm wearing my Apple watch and it tells me to breathe every so often. And sometimes I get all frustrated with it and I want to turn it off and be like, oh, that's annoying. But if I actually stop and do it, it really does have a cumulative positive effect. Um, and it's only 30 to 60 seconds. And it's things that we have within our own control to be able to help ourselves. And like Griselle best said at the beginning, you know, to help prevent some of this to be um, from some of this trauma becoming more um, intense and uh, more severe in of our behavioral health concerns. Yes, uh, Travers had something. Yeah, yeah so I, a lot of the things that all three of you said resonated with me and, and one of the, I think Becky may have brought it up, but um, you know, with the Tubbs fire, you know, we went through the Tubbs fire and there was never really any time for us to recover right? Because of what you said, you know, then we dealt with COVID and then we dealt with some civil unrest and then we dealt with additional fires impacting our community and our boundaries. So I don't think that we've really had time to, um, I guess, really take in all the feelings and emotions that we're feeling because we're constantly, as Susan said, in this state of readiness, this state of fight or flight, or what we call it on the public safety side, hypervigilance right? We always have to, and that's something we're, we tend to be good at. Um, it's not necessarily a good thing because we tend to get emotions and we shove them in our pocket and we just push them down, we push them down and we don't acknowledge them. We stay in that state of hypervigilance so we can deal with the next disaster because a lot of times we don't have the liberty to, to take a time out and to breathe and to, you know, take care of ourselves. And that's something historically we have not been good at. Um, but that's something that we are really changing within our organization as a whole and really taking care of the behavioral health component of our members and their long-term health as well. So I 100% I get what, you, what, what both of you said and the tie in there. And then Griselda, one of the things with our, um, you know, with you getting those messages and you getting those, you know, those Nixo alerts and, and really the intention of that is because there's so many questions out there when, like you said, you hear a fire siren or you, you know, feel the wind getting hotter and drier. We're sending those out as kind of uh, harnessing that technology as a communication tool to kind of let you know, hey, we've got this. We're acknowledging this is going on. We've aligned our forces. We're ready for battle. Um, you know, somewhat rest easy. We're taking, you know, we're taking care of it. So I guess it's perspective in a lot of ways, um, the way those are interpreted. Um, but just know and have some solace knowing that by us sending you that we're acknowledging, yes, our forces are lined up. We're ready to get, we're ready to put everything on the line for you, for the community and for each other. So if, if I could, and I'm not in a position to give advice in any way, but I would just say, know that that's a good thing because we're, we, we see it as well. We see what you're seeing and, and we're aligning our force to take care of it. 
Thank you, Travers. And I also like to invite, um, I know that we have participants on the line, if you all would like to uh, write in the chat, anything that's coming up for you all. Um, I did see that there was a question that came through. Um, we will leave questions till the end, um, but really just want to acknowledge what are some emotions or uh, what's coming up for you as you're hearing our panelists uh, discuss what is coming up for them. So feel free to drop them in the chat. Say something about mindfulness real quickly here, which is like the key to understanding, you know, we can be triggered and not know it. And uh, an odd trigger, when you asked us to think about triggers, I thought of this time when I was triggered by something and didn't realize it. So I was like, why am I feeling anxious? I was just, you know, Sunday afternoon, something I was like, what's going on? Why am I anxious? And I kind of like reviewed what was going on. And I realized I heard the neighbors talking, just having a relaxed conversation. I can overhear them and I uh, can't hear what they're saying, but they're just a, a tone of conversation. And then I traced that back to the night of Tubbs, before the Tubbs fire. Um, they were having a similar kind of conversation and they mentioned fire. And then later on, I thought back on that sequence of events and went, they, you know, there was awareness of the fire when it started that was being talked about. And then it led to all this. So, so all these months later, it's like such a seemingly innocuous thing was raising my anxiety level. And so mindfulness practices can allow us to understand what's going on in the mind, body, and spirit that's going to eventually amp up or, you know, show itself, um, but also to take in all of the improvements and all of the adjustments that have been made as support for us, you know, to take that in, like when anxiety comes up, yes, and we're not letting anything go very far anymore. You know, there may be something, uh, there was a fire in the grass down by the golf course here a while back, a couple weeks ago, and, uh, you know, it got out just so quickly. There was such a quick response. It's like, I, I like to take that in as our community is responding. That's part of how I can feel safer. And also to think through what are my plans? What can I do to feel safer? So thank you. Thank you, Susan. And I do wanna acknowledge that there were a few uh, comments that came through. Um, it, uh, it feels like everything was back to back. Um, this is very helpful, thank you. And, um, Fear for our frail community members, get anxious that they will vulnerable, that they are the most vulnerable during pandemic and other disasters. And also someone mentioned that the Breathe app has been a, a helpful reminder for them. So with that, I'd like to ask all of y'all, um, what is one tool, if you could call out one tool that has been helpful to um, keeping that hypervigilance or keeping you steady, um, what would you say it is and, and how do you use it in your daily life? And whoever would like to go first. I'll jump in. Of course. Um, so um, certainly the breathing, I think that's um, the one obviously we did and, and what is an easy go-to. Um, but uh, I do the technique that was taught to the collaborative around shaking and dancing. Um, that one is extremely helpful for me. Um, and just very briefly for everyone, it is uh, mindfulness with movement. So meditation does not always have to be sitting still and finding your zen. Um, you know, there's very much a physical component and um, I know myself, I, I think of meditation with movement and, and so the shaking, the literal just moving of your body, um, sometimes I, I do it to music if I have that available to me. Um, other times I have, I can attest, I have literally uh, during the pandemic gone into a bathroom in a grocery store because I was very anxious about being out and being at the grocery store and something happened there for me where anxiety was a little bit overwhelming and I found a stall and I just, I did it in the stall just so I, you know, people couldn't see me, but um, just really, I needed to kind of just shake it out. Uh, and, and that was literally all that it is. And, and spending a few moments and a few minutes doing that has been tremendous for me. Thank you, Becky. Travers or Susan? I think, and I'm an amateur in this game, 
but I think that, you know, the biggest thing that helps me is family is a huge, for me is a huge component, you know, having that support network at home is a huge component for me. But the, the thing that t- tends to help me the most is just spending time alone in your head. So there's so many distractors now in society. You know, we have, everybody has a computer in their pocket. It's really easy to um, maybe be feeling some sort of way and then distract yourself by going on a social media platform or texting or, um, you know, whatever is your escape, playing the music really loud so you're not alone in your thoughts. So I think the thing that's helped me the most is turning, is getting some separation from those devices from spending some quiet time just in my head so I can you know recognize kind of like what Susan was saying like hey why am I feeling this way today well if you if you're being honest with yourself and you recognize those symptoms or those feelings um, you can you can deal with them or you can put you know another measure into place so you can help help yourself work through that process but if you're always you know I get up in the morning I slam two cups of coffee and then I put my loud music on and I go into work. The minute I'm at work, I turn my computer on and then I'm going to my computer, my lunch break, I'm shoveling food in my face. I'm looking at social media and then I'm back on my computer again. You get no time. And it's really easy to do, right? We've all probably caught ourselves doing that, but I think it's so important. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a counselor, but I think it's so important to just spend time in your own space and listen to what's going on in your own head. Absolutely. Yeah, that quiet time or taking just taking a moment, even, you know, we live in a beautiful county too. like any time you can stop and contemplate some beauty, you know, take that minute that's actually helping your whole system, a beautiful sight, just taking it in. I do that anytime I can. Um, But one thing that I have found really helpful is something I learned from um, uh, Peter Levine, a trauma, a person who's been writing about trauma for about 50 years, probably by now. But it's this trauma hold, and you can try this with me if you want. So you take your right hand and you put it under your left arm and then take your other hand and put it, so you, you can see me. So basically <laughs> like that. So, so right hand under left arm and then the other arm, basically creating a container for your body. And then if you sh- just shut your eyes for a second, just feeling the solidity of the container. Just feeling, you know, I'm right here. Any emotions that come up, it's just like water through a garden hose. It just, it's, you know, we have this feeling like emotions are going to overwhelm us and we're solid right here. Just feeling that. And another variation is to put the other hand by your neck. So just the same thing, but just putting one hand by the neck. And there's a lot of nerve endings right there. And just your own physical contact can be very soothing. Another version of this, I've done this with our groups, is just put your hands by your heart and just saying, I'm right here. I'm right here. You know, I feel like the nervous system is kind of can be like a child lost in a shopping mall, you know, like, and then you, the child comes back and that they're still upset. You know, our adrenaline's going, we got all the chemicals going, but just, I'm right here. Maybe I can't find my keys for a second. I'm right here. Just come, it soothes the nervous system and brings us into the present moment. And one thing a teacher told me a long time ago is in the present moment, the devil can't find you. So if you can get yourself present, maybe that's playing tennis, maybe that's whatever it is, whatever the thing is that you do that gets you in the present moment that or being with family, that can be very healing because we're not in the regrets of the past or anxiety of the future. They're coming to right here. Thank you, Susan. Priscilla, what do you do? What do you do? (laughs) Curious. For me, I I have a toddler at home. So a lot of the times I'm hyper vigilant, making sure that she's not getting into trouble or getting her and, you know, being there for her. Um, but I've also learned a lot of, uh, that the way I respond is going to impulse how she's going to respond or impact how she's going to respond. Um, so we actually, uh, do a version of shaking and dancing where mommy puts her favorite song and, uh, and then we go do it together. Um, and we literally just wiggle it out and shake it out. It doesn't matter how we dance. Um, so that works well. Uh, the other one is uh, a breathing exercise, but I incorporate an imaginary balloon. And in this imaginary balloon, we put all our anger and all the feelings that are coming up so we can uh, think better. And so as she and I do that, and then she gets to pop my balloon, which is the funnest part to her. And to me, it's reminding me I'm here. She's happy. She's smiling. She's good. 
Um, and that has worked really well for not only myself, but also for her. There have been um, times where we're in a new place and she gets very anxious. So she'll say mama balloon and it's like, okay, we can breathe. And that's, that's her version of breathing. Um, and I also like to invite us now, I know Susan's gonna be guiding us into an exercise. And uh, after that, we'll do some Q and A and also uh, our folks that are on our panel today will be providing us with some resources on um, other things that we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Griselda. So I'm gonna lead an exercise that's part of the mind-body medicine training that we all received and it's called autogenics. And basically the idea behind this is that there's a link between the mind and the body, obviously. And there's a link between uh, the suggestion of, of uh, these words and what you're gonna feel in your physiology. So I invite everybody to just get comfortable again. Uh, you can turn off your camera if you like, um, sitting or lying, however you wanna do this. I'm gonna be just guiding through some phrases. And to just take a moment to get comfortable, maybe feel the um, contact place of your body on the chair or bed or whatever you're on feeling the support of the gravity right there. Just getting yourself really comfortable and just relaxing and letting these phrases sink in. And I'm gonna repeat each phrase six times. So it's, it's, it's very tedious, but there, there's a point to that. And it's okay if your mind wanders, if you're thinking about something else, you just, just gently invite it back, that's fine. Okay, so here we go. My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My legs are heavy and warm. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My heartbeat is calm and strong. I am at peace. My abdomen radiates warmth. 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 I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My forehead is pleasantly cool. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. My breathing is calm and relaxed. I am at peace. And just letting those phrases die away, letting yourself just feel your breathing, feeling the state that you're in at the moment. 
and very gently, no rush at all when you're ready. Open your eyes and return. So if we were in person, if we were doing this in a mind-body medicine group, we would have given you a bio dot so you could see your uh, temperature, your body temperature change. But basically, how, how was that for anyone? Curious. You notice anything different about when we started from, from where we started to where we ended? I can share. Um, I noticed that I'm in, I'm in my office, which it can get really cold in here. <laughs> Um, and I was just noticing uh, that one, my breathing is, you know, slower. My heart is not racing. Um, I was even able to feel like I could hear my heartbeat um, mm -hmm. and my hands started to get really warm. Yeah, I love that. I'm noticing my heartbeat. I think it's really important to just um, celebrate. Oh, I'm noticing more about my environment, my physiology, because those are the skills that we build on that eventually get us to have much more command of our nervous system. That's what we want is to be able to calm down when it's time to calm down and to be able to amp up when it's time to amp up. It's meant to be a flow. It's meant to be not stuck in one position, but just to flow with what's going on. So yeah, thank you. Because our physiology changes, right? I mean, that's the thing with stress is that we're gonna be, we're on and then I remember reading this thing that says cortisol is neurotoxic. I read it about six times. I was like, cortisol, okay. So stress hormones kill brain cells. I was like, oh, wow, that's kind of important to know. I wanna keep all my brain cells. So that means I don't wanna have any more stress hormones than I absolutely have to, to manage life. But any extra, it's like we, we need to address it. It's a health issue. It's a, it's a public issue really for all of us really to take care of our health is to understand how to calm down. So curious, anybody else with that exercise? How was that? I think it was good because it kind of like what we talked about before, it forces you to relax. Yeah. You know? And then you notice like when you relax, your mind kind of just starts to wander, but it's okay for it to do that. Um, just kind of, you know, letting it go and, and, you know, centering yourself and spending that, that quiet time in your head. Yeah. And when the mind wanders, the mind is meant to be looking out for stuff for us. That's why we survive. So to just gently, just like a child or a pet, like, come on back, come on, honey, you know, come back here because then we can let down. And if we have, we go from fight flight to rest and digest, we need to have that downtime to repair ourselves and to restore, restore the whole brain. That's the other part about it, is we don't function well when we're triggered. We're in basically when your computer is offline, that's a good analogy for once we're in, in that lower brain part, you know, the fight and flight, we've lost our cognitive function at some point. We don't make very good decisions. So restoring the whole brain is essential to functioning well, is to understand. And any athlete, you know, great athletes, they all know how to manage their state when the stakes are really high, right? That's why they're taking the deep breaths. That's why they're slowing down, so. Thank you. Awesome. So I, I actually, um, as, as you were talking, uh, Susan, and kind of reminding us of that fight, flight, or freeze response, right? Um, I, I kind of threw me back to 2017 and acknowledging that we all have a different response. Um, thinking about my partner and, you know, when we were getting evacuated, what his response was versus mine. And I froze. I didn't know, you know, I was like, this is surreal. Um, this isn't happening. And his response was grab the dogs, grab the computer and run out the door and make sure I was in my car. And so remember sitting there and just thinking, okay, you're okay. But also wasn't processing everything that was happening. Um, mm -hmm. And wish I would have had these tools, right? And as I was going through the training, remembering, oh, this would have been helpful. <laughs> Yeah. but now that we have them putting them in place. Mm -hmm. And you can be triggered and not know it. I mean, there was an event at Luther Rittering Center a few months after the fire. It was like a comedy benefit or some, some event. And I went to this event with a friend who I evacuated to her house actually. So we went to this event and when it was over, 
I, I was like, okay, all these cars close to this intersection that had a lot of fire on it. You know, I had associations with, with that whole area. And the next day she said, you were totally in PTSD last night. And I was like, I was? <laughs> it's like, I didn't even know. She said, yeah, you barely said goodbye to our friends. And I was like, oh my gosh, all I wanted to do is to get to my car and get out of the parking lot. I wasn't, no other consideration mattered to me. But I didn't know until she said that, that I was in PTSD. And so then something else happened. There was another event at Luther Burbank Center and I went, okay, I'm going. And this time I'm going to watch the reaction coming up and work with it. And I did, I waited till the end of the event. <laughs> I was like, I let the other cars go out, whatever. And I felt so great because it's like, I'm not going to let PTSD limit my life. I, I, it was like a victory over something that could have, well, let's close down, let's retract, let's not do things because it might bring up an uncomfortable feeling. But instead learning that with awareness and with good friends, with community, you know, we can help each other out with understanding this is, there's nothing wrong with you. It's a reaction to an abnormal event. It's a normal reaction to an abnormal event, actually. And there are ways to work with it. Yeah. Travers, is there anything you'd like to add or Becky? I was just thinking, you know, I mean, I certainly agree with what everybody's been kind of bringing forward and, and listening and thinking about, again, just, um, you know, the body's ability to, well, lack of ability, actually, to discriminate in, in what is a triggering event, what what is causing this reaction, what is causing anxiety or anything like that, and, and kind of brings me back to a, a moment in time when I had had some pretty significant surgery for, for me in my life, and um, but I had injured myself, and so the injury then caused the need for the surgery but listening and remembering from my doctor at the time saying that, you know, your body doesn't discriminate. You, know, you injured yourself, that's trauma. Surgery, while helpful, is still trauma. And, uh, and it just kind of reminds, it might, helps me remember that, you know, if I can be uh, present in the moment and present in my body and experience the whatever it's experiencing and allowing that acceptance, that it will inevitably help move it along as well. And so that it's not just um, getting stagnant or stuck in, in one specific place. Thank you. And Travers, I noticed you also unmuted. So feel free to jump in. Yeah, I was asked uh, if I'd like to share, you know, my experience with the, with the tubs and, and mine was a little bit unique and in, um, in that I was working the night of the tubs fire and my family, we lived up on Mark West Springs Road. So when the tubs kind of hit town initially, it came in as the nuns fire, it was out off Highway 12. And that's kind of where we started to allocate resources um, right off the bat. And I happened to be working on that engine that night um, that serviced that area. Um, and so we responded into what we soon found out was it was a huge incident, gonna be an expanded um, firefight. And we started fighting fire and quickly realized that um, we were getting overwhelmed, so we went into a, a life-saving mode with, um, with the residents in, there, in that area and just started really pulling people out of their houses and directing them towards safety. And about, about probably two hours into the firefight, I heard through the radio that the fire was passing Safari West. Well, that's, as the crow flies, that's seven miles about from where we were fighting the fire. So then you start to really start to picture this and, and realize that this is going to be something, you know, huge that we haven't dealt with. The second thought was my family lives right there. You know, our house was was in the fire's path. So I called my wife. She was sleeping at the time and um, woke her up and said, hey, you need to get out of the house. There's a fire coming. And she she sleeps like the dead. So she's took her took her a little while to kind of come around. And she asked me, she said, are you home right now? And I said, I'm not home. Um, I'm not. I'm at work. I, you know, I'm working until six tonight. And she said, well, somebody turned all the lights of the house on. Well, it was the fire. So the fire had already started to involve our, our house. So I sent her, I said, hey, just grab the kids. We had two, well, we still have two young kids, but they were a lot younger then. Um, and I said, just grab the kids and leave. So as I'm talking to her on the phone, I hear the smoke alarms going off. Um, and I said, hey, just call me when you're safe, right? So this, if, I don't know if you remember or not, but the cell towers went down that night also. So there was no phone calls to be made, no texts. So for an eight, nine hour period, I just didn't know if my family's okay, if they'd made it out or not. So 
Um, so we can just like we tend to do, we, we can just continue to do our job. We took that stress and that moment because at that moment, there's nothing I could do to help my family um, and put it kind of just put it in my pocket and I didn't deal with it. Um, and then they made it to safety. Eventually the next morning at a little past nine in the morning, my wife sent me a text um, and just said, Hey, we're safe. We're in Rona park. So that was, you know, good. That weight was taken off my shoulders. But um, the reason I tell you this story is not for to, 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 to trigger anybody or to um, compare my experience to anyone else's. But the point I want to make is we all deal with stress differently, right? So I dealt with it by just keeping my head focused and at work. And I have a, who's my boss now, who told me, he said, hey, you need to go see your family. And this was, I think, probably four or five days into the incident because I hadn't called them. I hadn't interacted with them as long as they were safe. And I knew that it was like, great, then I will, I'll unpack this bag down the road. Right. Um, but he, he kind of forced me to, he said, no, you're leaving, you're going, you're going to go see your family. So I was able to do that. And it is, it was very apparent in the way I was dealing with that stress and the way my family was dealing with that stress. Right. And so they, we both had different experiences from the same incident but I'm used to dealing with stress because we encounter it every day, right? That's our job. We have to learn to compartmentalize stress. We have to learn how to unpack that stress when the time's appropriate. They were kind of looking to me for some guidance on how to deal with this stress. And, you know, I really didn't have that ability to give that to them. So, you know, my biggest point is that we all, we all deal with stress in different ways. Um, the biggest thing I learned from that was how to not put my, how to not put my beliefs and how to not put, you know, my thoughts or I guess my expectations on other people and how they should deal with stress because everybody's just gonna, you know, deal with it. It took my wife some time to, you know, feel comfortable again um, during the red flag warnings. We rebuilt in the same exact place. So, you know, there's obviously some, you know, always gonna be in the back of their mind. My kids ask, you know, now it's pretty common for my kids to ask, how many times are we going to be evacuated this year? Because they want to go to a hotel and hang out and have fun. Um, but um, that's the biggest message I would say for the community is that, um, you know, we recognize everybody's going to deal with this differently. And we are here to support you. And like I said in the beginning, you know, we're, we are forward facing and, you know, we don't mind being vulnerable. And that's kind of another reason I told you the story is that, you know, we, we, we deal with the same, we deal with a lot of the same stresses. We just maybe deal with them in, in a different way in a different fashion. Thank you, Travers. And that reminds me, you know, you mentioned the next alerts are there to remind and acknowledge that we as a community are going to be okay. And our first responders are acting upon that. Um, and so I'd like to invite uh, Susan, Becky and Travers also, if there are any other resources that you would like to share at this time with our, um, with the folks that are watching us, anything else that people can keep in mind. And I did see a question come in about the warm line, um, if it's in Spanish. We do have a, uh, we do have a Spanish speaking person who can answer warm line calls. And we're actually just about to launch a, a family support group in Spanish, really, really excited about that. Um, so yeah, um, just in terms of resources from NAMI, we have our warm line, it's 866-960-6264. Um, um, and info at NAMI SoCo is another way to reach us. Uh, we offer um, all of our regular mental health uh, services, but for specifically for this, we have uh, we have had a wildfire support group that went on for a while and then it morphed into wellness and stress relief group every Wednesday from 12 to one. So that's free to anybody. They can uh, email info at NAMI SoCo to join that. We just do, we do basically these kinds of tools we just keep teaching tools, different, you know, people respond differently to different tools. Just trying out new things to work with the nervous system is the wellness group. Um, the warm line, we also have something called NAMI talks where we're doing little uh, talks each month. And uh, there's gonna be one, I'm gonna be doing one on boundaries on June 16th from 5.30 to 6.30. And we'll probably do something a little later in the fall on tools for wildfire readiness or something that extends these um, practices because they're so practical. You know, what do you do when you're in Walmart and you're freaking out and you, you know, you, you're, um, uh, 
needing to handle your life, but you're also feeling uh, triggered. So that's, we focus on that. So info at NAMI SoCo and um, the warm line are ways to reach us. And then we have all of our other services, which are for people dealing with mental health diagnosis in a loved one, support for the family members and support for the person. So you can check out our website. Okay. I'm gonna direct this one to Becky. I've moved back into my rebuilt home in Hidden Valley Estates. I would like to visit my family in Arizona, Oregon and Washington, but I'm afraid to be away from home between May and November. I feel trapped and unable to leave my home. Um, should there be a fire war when I'm gone? And it's, go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, very, very real concern. Um, so SOS Community Counseling, as I had mentioned before, uh, we are a collective of therapists. And, um, you know, I kind of just want to circle back to something that Trevor said uh, earlier about, uh, he was saying, oh, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm an amateur, something like that. I don't remember exactly what you said, but um, but that you that you don't have to be to be able to to use these skills. Like we want people to be able to cope and heal and you know do as much self care as one can do. But then if there becomes a need where things have you know risen to a higher level, um, you know SOS community counseling is there. Um, we do pro bono work for those where a fee might be a struggle. And certainly that's been the case for a lot of people, especially during the pandemic, uh, losing employment or having wages decrease. Uh, so you're welcome to reach us uh, by phone. 284-3444 is our uh, intake line, um, area code 707, of course. Um, but we serve all through Sonoma County and currently operating um, in this platform and predominantly in a telehealth Zoom platform where we can have sessions with you um, wherever an individual might be. Uh, we are also seeing people face to face at our clinic in Santa Rosa, um, but we also have uh, clinics in Roanoke Park, uh, Cloverdale, um, and uh, working on Windsor as well. So um, we're out there in the community. And then there was one other thing I wanted to offer and I'm totally blanking on what it was that, uh, but come back to me, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put it together. <laughs> Thank you. And Travers, is there anything you'd like to add before we wrap up? Yeah, I was just talking about the person that I can, I have some empathy for the person that says, hey, I don't wanna leave my home. I'm the same, I go through the same thing. I try and go and you know spend time in the outdoors in August, September. And it's always, you know, I was now I feel very leery to do that, I'm leaving my family in this, you know, in that same area. Granted, we've cleared all vegetation away from our house and we've really hardened our home, which has given me a lot of peace of mind that, hey, if I, if I do leave this, I can leave this to the professionals now that I have a defendable platform at my home. So one, and it's not really along the mental health lines. Um, as an avenue or a website, but if you do go to um, srcity.org backslash wildfire ready, there are some tips there on what you can do to your home to be sure your home is hardened. Just, you know, we're trying to be, we're trying to be, I don't want to say we're trying to be hardened, but we're trying to put in some mechanisms to, to deal with these stressors. But, you know, that's an avenue for you to give you, like I said, a little bit of peace of mind that when you do leave your home, it's gonna be a lot in a lot safer and more defendable position. So I know it's not along, like I said, along the behavioral health or mental health lines, but um, that is something that's helped me um, preparing my home and allowing that to be a safe place um, if, if, if we do have to go through this again. Well, thank you all so much. I appreciate you all being here today. Um, with I that, I remember Griselda, yes. sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Becky. No worries. No, I just, I wanted to at least mention that, um, you know, should evacuations happen again, wildfire happen again, um, hope, crossing my fingers it doesn't, um, but SOS is part of the um, Sonoma County COAD, and we are a member of the Emotional Spiritual Committee of that COAD, so we do have um, people available when um, evacuation takes place or there are re-entry points. So if you're coming back to your home, um, we try to get people out there to support in uh, real life time when those kinds of things happens, whether it's a temporary shelter or permanent shelter that you may have been evacuated to. 
Um, or like um, Trevor said, if you're coming back to your house and maybe something's happened and you just wanna have some support and going back to your property, we're there as well. Great, thank you all so much. And I'm actually gonna close out our circle as I usually close out all my other meetings and that's just with music. Um, and feel free to stick around until the song ends or, um, or just go ahead and listen and log off when you are ready. Have a great day and thank you for joining us today.